Okay, welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this event. It's a little improvised, as you can tell, um, and we are recording the event, uh, certainly the presentation and the discussion afterwards, just as a point of information. My name is Axel Gelfert. I uh, uh, run the theoretical philosophy group here at Technische Universität Berlin. And uh, today it's my great pleasure to welcome two guests, uh, David Cody from the University of Tasmania and Philipp Hübel from the University of the Arts here in Berlin uh, to enter into a conversation about uh, some work that David will be presenting to us. David, as I mentioned, is based at the University of Tasmania. He is probably known to many of us uh, and many of those uh, viewing remotely for his work in social epistemology, applied social epistemology. I think we first communicated about uh, the epistemology of rumor, and then a few years later, a fake news became a big thing. And uh, today's topic will be on echo chambers and uh, related uh, phenomena. So great to have you here, okay. David. Take it away. Well, thank you very much, and, and, and thanks for, for organizing this. Uh, the term echo chamber has yet to offer a definition in <coughs> theory, but at least the kind of term filter bubble has not done much better. It's true that some definitions have emerged, but there's no consistency amongst them. And none of this is eventually providing that one of these terms referred to as if we all know what they are. Now, uh, Axel Brunt, uh, whose position on this, I think, is perhaps in many ways closest to mine, has also complained about the lack of clear and consistent definitions of such terms. So, this is what Axel Brunt says about the, the plethora of different uh, definitions, and he says, well, perhaps we should just stop talking about these things altogether. Uh, but then he says, no, uh, although technically the problem is that these terms will continue to be used and misused by journalists, politicians, and the general public, even if scholars abandon them, as researchers are uh, best opportunity to promote more precise definitions. I'll be giving some general reasons over the next few minutes for thinking that the project of providing improved and precise definitions is not worth pursuing. Uh, for now, however, uh, it's worth noting, I think, a puzzling ambivalence in this passage uh, about the ability of scholars and researchers to influence public debate. Uh, on the one hand, you'll notice academics are said to have so little influence that they cannot either by precept or example realistically hope to stop people from using these terms. But on the other hand, academics are supposed to have so much influence that they can get them to use them in a term in accord with their own uh, preferred definitions. Uh, so, look, the, the truth is uh, that academics and researchers and scholars generally can sometimes have a significant impact on public debate, uh, and including uh, by promoting or uh, disavowing certain terms. The term echo chamber, of course, was itself first introduced by an academic. So it is true uh, that there are circumstances in which uh, to borrow the words of Bishop Barclay, we ought to think with the learned and speak with the vulgar. And hence, I will occasionally use these terms in the following, so don't pick me up on that. Uh, when I do so, I'm only doing so in order to uh, accord with specific definitions and bring out some of the implications of those definitions. Okay, so often the terms echo chamber and filter bubble are used interchangeably. However, some authors have insisted that they should be understood as referring to distinguishable phenomenon. Uh, the philosopher C.T. Nguyen has uh, <clears throat> particularly influential in making this distinction. Filter bubbles, he tells us, are an instance of the broader category he calls epistemic bubbles. Uh, an epistemic bubble, he tells us, is a structure of people who aren't, quote, exposed to people from the opposite side. And a filter bubble is an epistemic bubble which is technologically uh, mediated, for example, one course by personalised algorithms used by contemporary search engines. An echo chamber, by contrast, is a structure of people who, quote, come to distrust everyone on the outside. Uh, so the key difference is that epistemic and hence filter bubbles omit the testimony of outsiders, whereas echo chambers promote distrust of outsiders, which makes the omission of their testimony unnecessary. Nguyen makes it clear that he regards epistemic uh, bubbles and echo chambers as both being bad things. However, he thinks echo chambers are worse. Uh, because it's harder to extricate uh, oneself from them and because he thinks they're more widespread. In fact, he rather strikingly claims uh, at one point uh, that, quote, there probably aren't any epistemic bubbles uh, since, quote, most people are regularly exposed to uh, news from the other side. Now, I think we can charitably interpret Nguyen as saying they don't really exist as a bit of hyperbole here since the literature which he cites in support of that claim 
actually says uh, they're rarer than they're often held to be. Uh, doesn't say they don't exist. Uh, but before considering uh, how widespread they are or whether they exist, we need a clearer picture of what they are. So uh, in particular, we need to consider what it means to be, quote, uh, exposed to people from the other side, as Nguyen uses uh, in, in Nguyen's language. Uh, his examples and the literature he cites make it clear uh, that he's referring to the other side of the so-called liberal slash conservative divide. What he means is uh, you're liberal, you listen to conservatives and vice versa. Sound political opinion uh, <coughs> on this view uh, comes only after hearing the best or most influential figures from each side of this divide. Uh, Nguyen seems to share the view of Private Willis in Gilbert Sullivan's Iolanthi. I'll put the next slide. Um, yes, that every boy and every girl that's born into the world alive is either a little bit a little liberal or a little conservative um, and that's uh, you'll note from 1882 of course they weren't being serious they thought that this was a new faddish idea that people divided into the liberal and the conservatives um, but now it's a fairly striking feature that that's no longer considered fun funny people think that that's really does describe humanity and it describes them as it were across time and across space and and even you get books talking about you know the liberal brain and the conservative brain as if these are not local concepts uh, so elsewhere I've argued against the popular idea that liberal and conservative should be treated as exhaustive or even as mutually exclusive categories. Uh, and I think this is very important. Uh, it's a particularly Anglo-American, I think, version of the more general Western notion that there are precisely two sides, neither more nor less to every political issue, whether those sides are called liberal, conservative, left, right, or something else, uh, which is so deeply ingrained in um, Western political cultures. Uh, I think the idea is both a product and a reflection of the fact that in all, most all Western countries, uh, there is a political duopoly, in effect, in which you've got two major political parties or sometimes coalitions of parties, um, and political change basically consists in them taking turns in power. Okay. Uh, so while most public debate, of course, is a product of that and also promoting it, reinforcing that, uh, tends to be confined to the relatively few issues about which they disagree. So looked at in that light, the recent findings according to which, uh, which win cites, according to which filter bubbles are rare or non-existent, is actually much less reassuring than he seems to think. People may well be exposed to both sides of the liberal and conservative establishment uh, media, but that's no reason to think they're getting genuine diversity in their sources of information and arguments. It's not even a reason for thinking they're getting accurate information or cogent argument. Uh, so Noam Chomsky was making exactly that point in the next slide, if I could just have that. Uh, smart way to keep people passive and obedient, this is what this some time ago, of course, uh, is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but to allow very lively debate within that spectrum, giving people the sense that free thinking is going on. Now, I hope this makes it clear that any attempt to explain the alleged problem bubbles in terms of exposure to the so-called other side is misguided. So is there some other way of understanding what a bubble is? Uh, in another article, uh, slightly later an article, Nguyen has offered a quite different definition of a bubble, which at first sight might seem more promising. He says it's a, a bubble is a social epistemic structure, there's a quote, which has inadequate coverage through a process of exclusion by omission. Uh, and we can think, get a sense of uh, what Nguyen thinks is inadequate about such bubbles uh, when, uh, by what he calls the two primary forces responsible for the alleged problems. So the first of these is, uh, quote, our tendency to seek like-minded sources. Um, so if I could just have the next uh, slide. Um, uh, he says that we usually like people are similar to us uh, and such similarity makes coverage gaps more likely. Uh, friends make good parties, but poor information networks. Now we have a straightforward account of one way in which epistemic bubbles can form. We can build a structure for one set of purposes, maintaining social relations, and then proceed to use it for another purpose for which it functions badly, information gathering. Now, I, I don't think this is a very, it's a very common argument, uh, and he uh, says it particularly clearly there, but I think it's a, uh, a, a mistaken argument. I think uh, in the first place it involves a uh, a simplistic notion and a misleading notion of friendship. Um, it's just not true, uh, I think, that we uh, like and so befriend people 
who are similar to us. Uh, what is true, as Aristotle said, is that some similarities with respect to values in particular are very important to friendship. Uh, however, as others, including Aristotle himself, acknowledges uh, that a difference is uh, at least as important uh, as similarity to friendship. Now, of course, Wing could reply to that, he could concede that and, and reply that whatever the correct account of friendship might be, uh, it's clearly quite a different process from information gathering. Uh, and hence, there's some reason to think that what serves one purpose well won't, will serve the other one poorly. Um, and I don't think that argument's very strong either. Uh, first, friendship is, of course, often uh, to a very great extent uh, based on mutual sharing of information. Um, whether that information consists in, you know, recipes for shortbread or scandalous doings of neighbours or current government policies or, or whatever. Second, um, uh, it's important to keep in mind, I think, that the real issue is not whether friendship gives us good or adequate epistemic coverage, but whether it's better than relevant alternatives. So what are the relevant alternatives that Nguyen has in mind? Now, it's pretty clear that the relevant alternatives is there is a kind of nostalgia here to the days of broadsheet newspapers uh, and uh, filters being managed by, you know, experts in politics, as it were, experts in the common good or something along those lines. And now I've argued against that conception of journalism and editorship, and I'd be had, glad to discuss that afterwards, but they, I think that's uh, my response to that. Um, now, there's a second primary force which Nguyen identifies as being responsible for this alleged problem of bubbles, uh, and that is algorithmic personal filtering. Uh, so search engines, as I'm sure you all know, and social media companies too, use algorithms to keep track of our personal data and use that data uh, to determine which information and arguments uh, to which we are exposed. This personalised filtering is essential to Eli Parisa's original concerns about filter bubbles. Um, the problem, as uh, Parisa sees it, is that um, personalization, quote, serves up uh, a kind of invisible auto propaganda indoctrinating us with our own ideas. Now, um, I'm, I realize I'm, I'm running short of time here, so I'll just say uh, I'm happy to field questions about that. I'm responsive to that, but it's, it's a little bit long. And um, uh, the short version of it, I, I think that is an overblown concern. Uh, I, I think the, the privacy, uh, the, the concern is that these algorithms are, are secret, is a, a real concern, and it is scandalous that they're secret, but the personalization thing I don't think is a, actually a problem. Okay? The, the secrecy is the problem, and that's, it's, it's a different issue. Uh, so look, moving on to echo chambers, have, have it filled questions about why I don't think that's an issue. Uh, many authors simply identify echo chambers with uh, filter bubbles, however, and Nguyen argues influentially uh, that they refer to distinct phenomena. Uh, his definition of an echo chamber is as follows. Uh, so it's an epistemic community which creates a significant disparity in trust between members and non-members. Uh, this disparity is created by excluding non-members through epistemic discrediting while simultaneously amplifying members' epistemic credentials. Finally, echo chambers are such that general agreement with some core set of belief uh, is a prerequisite for membership, where those core beliefs include uh, beliefs that support that disparity of trust. Now, <clears throat> echo chambers, on this way of understanding them, outside forces aren't omitted as they are in, in bubbles, rather they're given little credibility, while insiders are given significantly more credibility. Now, Nguyen writes of echo chambers as if they are self-evidently bad things, these things. All these examples of echo chambers, uh, for example, neo-Nazi groups, uh, climate change skeptics, uh, pizza gate believers, and so on, are of communities which are defined by false beliefs, that is, the beliefs that are prerequisites for membership are false ones. Uh, furthermore, the beliefs in question in all those examples are so very clearly false that Nguyen can safely assume that none of his readers will be tempted to believe them. It's just an assumption that uh, the author and the reader are, uh, as it were, not in one of these bubbles. Um, <clears throat> they're not only false, the, these prerequisite beliefs, uh, they're also objectionable in other ways, most notably they're irrational and harmful and in at least one case quite bizarre. However, we must be careful not to jump uh, from the premise that these communities, these echo chamber communities, are objectionable 
and echo chambers to the conclusion that they're objectionable because they are echo chambers. The suspicion that Nguyen has employed this kind of invalid inference is suggested by the fact that there appear to be many benign epistemic communities promoting true beliefs which fit Nguyen's definition of an echo chamber uh, just as well as the bad ones that he gives. So Nguyen characterizes climate deniers or climate skeptics, uh, as he ultimately calls them, as an echo chamber. But it appears that climate scientists whose conclusions that these people deny or are skeptical about are also an echo chamber on his definition. So climate scientists, if you look at the definition up there, just like uh, climate deniers, create a significant disparity in trust between members and non-members. Uh, that's because climate scientists rightly trust the methods and conclusions of other climate scientists over the methods and conclusions of people outside that community uh, when it comes to questions about the climate, that is, not, not on other issues. Furthermore, through processes such as peer review and academic credentialing, uh, they exclude, you know, quote, non-members through epistemic discrediting while simple simultaneously amplifying members' epistemic credentials, uh, every bit as much as climate deniers. Finally, agreement, uh, quote, with some core set of beliefs, which supports that disparity of trust, is every bit as much a prerequisite for membership of the community of climate scientists as it is for the membership of the community of climate deniers. And this is, I think, the more, most important part here. No one would be permitted into the community of climate scientists, for example, if they didn't believe that theories should be supported by evidence, by observation, more specifically, uh, and that conclusions should be supported by national argument, or if they believe that the at atmosphere consists in fairy dust, or the clouds are really flying sheep. Hence, climate science is also an echo chamber on Nguyen's definition, uh, and I'll leave it an exercise for listeners to uh, see that uh, the broader community of those of us who believe the conclusions of climate scientists are also an echo chamber as the community of climate scientists themselves are. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's the last part of Nguyen's definition, I think, according to which the holding of a certain set of beliefs is a prerequisite for membership of an echo chamber uh, that gets to the heart of the issue here. Nguyen argues that it's very difficult to extricate oneself from an echo chamber since any evidence that the propositions being echoed in it are false can be neutralized uh, by uh, what he calls preemptive epistemic discrediting of those presenting the evidence. He even argues this kind of evidential preemption can actually turn evidence against the propositions in uh, questions into evidence for them. And he thinks that the solution, indeed he thinks the only solution to this uh, so-called problem is for someone who is stuck in an echo chamber to, quote, temporarily suspend belief in all their beliefs. This idea, as Nguyen himself recognizes, uh, basically goes back to Descartes' famous or infamous method of doubt. Now, without going too deeply into centuries of scholarship on that topic, the main problem with Descartes' idea, I think, is that for doubt to be rational, it has to be based on reasons. This isn't my insight, this is several of Descartes' contemporaries, I think, saw this, and the reasons for doubt cannot themselves, at the time, be subject to doubt. In short, one cannot rationally doubt one's own reasons for doubting. Nguyen, like Descartes, appeared to think, appears to think that it's possible to evaluate evidence from an entirely neutral position. But if the history of 20th century philosophy, roughly, has taught us anything, it's that this kind of pure inquiry is impossible and unnecessary. Reasoning requires premises, and one cannot remain neutral about the premises from which one reasons, one must believe them. So despite Nguyen's dramatic talk of suspending all beliefs, he mostly focuses on a particular subset of our beliefs, which he calls credentialing beliefs, a belief that is about whom to believe. In order to get out of an echo chamber, he claims, it's necessary to suspend our credentialing beliefs and reconstruct them from scratch. He describes this process as a social epistemic uh, reboot. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, here it is. Uh, so he imagines this is what we should all do to make sure we're not in echo chambers, uh, must take on the social epistemic posture that we might expect from a cognitive newborn, one of tentative but the feasible trust in all apparent testimonial uh, sources. Now, I think one problem with this idea is that it presupposes that we can divide our beliefs into those we get from testimonial sources, uh, those we get 
from non-testimonial sources. I don't think that's actually possible, but um, <clears throat> yeah, so I don't think it's a practical suggestion from that point. Um, but even if we could, you know, why why focus only on the testimonial ones? Why not? Why not all of them? Um, now, I think uh, I think that this is misguided. He's got a case study which I just won't go to, go into here of a neo-Nazi who you know turned into a non-neo-Nazi and an anti-racist campaigner, uh, and Win claims that the process uh, he went through was precisely this kind of social epistemic reboot. He suspended judgment in uh, his prior beliefs. I just, um, an analysis of what went on, which is, that's not what happened. That's what I've got to claim, but I, I won't. So yeah, just very quickly connect this up with um, uh, the issues of confirmation uh, bias and uh, polarization, which I think are interestingly connected. The rhetoric surrounding the term echo chamber is intimately connected with the neo-Cartesian myth, point of claim I've just made, that there's a view from nowhere from which each of us can, and at least in certain circumstances, should survey all of our beliefs, or at any rate some significant subset of them, such as you know, credentialing beliefs. Uh, a more or less explicit commitment to this myth can be found in two other neologisms, which have recently emerged from the social sciences and embraced by popular media and, and certain parts of philosophy, uh, those of confirmation bias and polarization. The so-called problems of filter bubbles and echo chambers are almost invariably attributed not only to the internet, to, not only to internet technology or one of its applications, but also to confirmation bias, a species of bias that is supposed to be inherent in all human beings, though some are usually supposed to be better at counteracting its influence than others. The philosopher Lee McIntyre defines uh, confirmation bias up there as the tendency to give more weight to information that confirms one of our pre-existing beliefs. Now, I think it's clear that there's nothing wrong with confirmation bias. Uh, so it's not really a bias. Um, it should be clear there's nothing wrong with it. If I see what appears to be, look, I have to change my example here. because this If I see what appears to be, uh, imagine the door was open, uh, a kangaroo bouncing past outside there, my pre-existing belief that there are no kangaroos in this part of the world will rightly lead me to treat the information presented to my eyes with less credibility than I otherwise would. If biases are dispositions to make false or irrational judgments, which I think is what a bias is, uh, then so-called confirmation bias is not a bias at all. Of course, there is such a thing as being overly pig-headed or too reluctant to change one's mind, which is what people are really getting at here, um, just as there's uh, an opposite vice, the, that of being too willing to change one's mind, but we didn't need social scientists to tell us that people have always been aware that these are these, uh, as it were, two vices. Uh, you can think of, um, I, 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 I have a longer version of this, the, the, the virtue of realism on this issue uh, is hitting a middle, a mean between two vices, that of uh, being too pig-headed and that of vacillation, someone who just constantly changes their mind. Okay. Uh, when Cass Stunstein and Ilo Parisa first introduced the concepts of echo chambers and filter bubbles, they presented them as causes of a single underlying problem, the polarization of our political discourse. The idea that polarization is a problem has achieved the status of conventional wisdom in the social sciences and corporate media over the last two decades. Even Axel Runs, who I mentioned before, who argues that filter bubbles and echo chambers are not a significant problem, or at least not one caused by internet, internet technology, accepts this diagnosis of our current political situation. He just thinks that the problem of polarization is caused by, quote, the filters in our heads, not in our networks. Uh, I <coughs> did a little research on this, and apparently there are 35 books explicitly devoted to the so-called problem of polarization published over the last decade alone. Now, I think all this is a, a mistake. The problem with the belief systems we've been looking at, neo-Nazism, -Nazi climate denial, or vaccine skepticism, isn't that they are at one end of a political spectrum, or if you prefer, uh, one pole of a political spectrum. The problem in each case is that they're at the wrong end of the spectrum. When those engaging in handling about polarization complain that politics shouldn't be about a battle between us versus them, we need to ask if it shouldn't be that, what should it be? Now, the standard answer, of course, is that uh, politics should be about solutions to shared problems. Uh, this is the rhetoric. 
of managerialism, the ideology of managerialism, which I think is a particularly sinister ideology because it presents itself as non-ideological. Uh, according to managerialism, we're all in the same team, or to borrow Plato's famous figure of the ship of state, we're all in the same boat. This is an idea neatly embodied in a cartoon, which was widely, widely shared after Trump's election. I think that's it, there yeah, it is. Uh, uh, which shows a passenger standing up in a commercial plane saying, these smug pilots have lost touch with regular passengers like us who thinks I should fly the plane. This is sort of the triumph of non-experts. Uh, now, there are several problems with analogies of this kind and the managerialist conception of politics, which it presupposes. I think this is just a version of uh, Plato's argument. The most important of them, uh, I'll skip one of them, the values one, uh, is that unlike people traveling by boat or plane, uh, we do not all have the same interests. People traveling on a shared means of transport are united by a shared interest in getting to an agreed destination quickly, comfortably, and above all, safely. By contrast, people living together in political communities often have vital conflicting interests about the destination of the political community. <clears throat> the best known, in my opinion, most example, uh, best important example of this in contemporary political communities is to be found in the relation between labour and capital. Roughly speaking, one class of people have an interest in higher wages and shorter working hours, while another class of people have an interest in the former class getting lower wages and longer working hours. Given this managerialist claims that politics consists in attempts to solve common problems should be viewed in the light of the following exchange uh, in the great Billy Wilder, who was actually a German director, uh, Asian Hole, uh, uh, the reporter says to uh, other reporter, Charles Tatum, we're all in the same boat and he replies, I'm in the boat, you're in the water. Now let's see how you can swim. Uh, so the idea that we're all in the same boat was standardly used to invoke our shared in interest in something, of course, these days, that has been known as the economy since the mid 18th century. And the well-being of this uh, putative entity, the economy, is, of course, measured by indicators such as the stock market, which primarily benefit business owners and investors, rather than being measured through wages or benefits paid to those who can't work. Uh, so the metaphor of a political community as a boat remains what it was, I'd submit in Plato's day, a form of anti-democratic propaganda, which um, rules over this distinction between travelling shared passengers on a transport and uh, an actual political community. So some forms of polarisation are good, some are bad. Polarisation itself is neither good nor bad. Perhaps I should stop there. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um... I would suggest that we um, sort of you know, start off the debate. Um, I could imagine that Philip will have quite a few points uh, in response. Um, and I just sort of want to start by placing your presentations in the context of your broader um, work, since um, there's a sort of, seems to be sort of a pattern there that you're having <laughs> attacked, uh, you know, um, sort of. Uh, just this sort of conspiracy theorizing, mm -hmm. saying, look, it's not the down in the conspiracy, it's not the conspiracy aspect of an explanation that makes it a bad explanation, it's just that some explanations are wrong, mm -hmm. and there's nothing really special about them. But a similar argument that can be made about fake news, where of course we um, have interacted mm -hmm. and in some ways responded um, uh, to one another, um, saying that fake news has always been around, it's nothing new, maybe there are different technical realizations of it. Um, but uh, it can easily be turned into a weapon that uh, sidelines critical voices, that um, puts even more pressure on, on marginalized uh, groups. So that basically a shared concern uh, on the one hand, philosophically at a conceptual level saying look, um, a lot of these debates are sort of overblown, but fueled by a political um, uh, uh, sort of uh, Belief, I take it, that a lot of these debates are not only overblown, but they are also at the service of whether intentionally or not, mm -hmm. they lend themselves to these kind of what you call anti democratic um, yes. uh, moods. Uh, yes. Anti democratic and anti free speech, uh, in, in, especially in the press of fake news. Uh, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Um, and do you think that this is in any way, um, is that a sort of for you a coincidence, or do you think there's something about possibly the, I don't want to sort of too far away from your actual presentation right now, yeah. but is there sort of a, a sense in which maybe the academic type, uh, academic philosophy um, is set up in a way that it um, 
Yeah. This is these vital um, societal goals of promoting more discourse rather than less, or having a larger window of um, debates open to more voices. Um, yeah. Um, look, that's that's a great question. I mean, I, 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 the short I, I could give a long answer, but I think the shorter answer is, is better in this case. And I think the shorter answer is that um, a lot of academics are actually not very democratically minded. Um, look, uh, if you could take, you know, it's like Plato's case. In, in Plato's day, of course, he could say, I'm against democracy, democracy is stupid, this is why, and no one would blink an eye. But for the most part, very few academics would be willing to come out and say, I'm against democracy. Some do. Uh, um, I think that's kind of unfortunate because I'm not. Um, but they have a sort of a rhetoric which allows them to say what is effectively anti democratic things without actually saying I'm against democracy. And I think the best example, extended version of this, would be about populism. Um, very standard trope in academic circles these days is to think that it's one of the big problems apart from is, is populism. Uh, the populism is supposed to be a bad thing. And when you really press people on what they mean by populism, it seems to mean they simply mean democracy. Uh, it's no longer acceptable, so I'm against democracy, but it's very acceptable indeed. It's morally required, I think, um, <coughs> in certain circles, amongst the professional managerial class to say I'm against populism. Uh, but I think it's just a sort of nice way of saying something that's like actually not socially acceptable. Yeah, I like the attitude of debunking all these sort of huge um, big concepts. Mm -hmm. And many questions I have are more like questions for clarification. So I might start with polarization. Mm -hmm. So I gather from yourself that you say polarization is not in itself bad, yeah. but it's uh, sort of uh, presented as something that is a danger to yes. democracy. And uh, yes, I'd say indeed that it's absolutely essential to democracy. Yeah. Democracy would be unnecessary if you are. Yeah. If there wasn't polarization. Um, so the, there's some, I, I just want to confront you with some findings, and mm -hmm. I was yeah. wondering how you would sort of mm, put them into your framework. Mm -hmm. So there's, there are some countries who are said to be polarized, for example, the US, and others like Germany, on many accounts, are not very yeah. polarized. Um, and in the US, there are three. Uh, very often cited findings or studies. One is uh, there's a study from the Pew Research Center when you ask Americans 10 policy questions and they started this, I think, in the early 1990s mm -hmm. for 30 years now. And you can see that uh, the median of the answers of uh, Republicans and Democrats, so it's questions mm -hmm. about immigration, homosexuality, uh, child care, like broad range of sort of policy mm -hmm. questions and you could see the median sort of uh, was very close to one another mm -hmm. uh, and you had a lot of overlap yeah so for the democrats right of the median of the republicans and republicans left of the median of the democrats and now you you see within the last 10 years or so yeah. the medians are far yeah. away from one another interestingly more the democrats are moving to the left so to say, yeah, no, can I just come in? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I have, I, I'm aware of that and I, I do have uh, a view about this. And I, yeah. I, I think I, I think the study itself is, is misleading because you will notice that that tends to, uh, and this comes back to you know, basically exactly the part I got in there, but yeah. you know, some forms of polarization are good, some are bad. Um, yes, there's been polarization around cultural issues, and that's what that's picking up on. Yeah. I'll bet one of the questions they're not asking is what do you think of neoliberal economics versus, say, um, social democracy? Yeah. Um, and that, unfortunately, is an issue that is no longer polarizing because uh, it's no longer grand economic theory is no longer debated in the public yeah. sphere. Uh, the assumption is. Um, um, there's no alternative, and that's bipartisan, major party, everywhere. Um, and that's the issue about which there should be polarization. So there's been, I think, a major propaganda effort over a period of the last 
30 years, not to get with polarisation, but to channel it into cultural issues and away from economic issues, uh, which to my mind is to a very large degree channeling it away from things that you know, should be dividing us. Right. Uh, and if we have genuine conflicts of interest and we should be debating those, uh, where, uh, where there's a big sort of country cultural issue. Or not, so. But in a sense, you could argue if you have polarization of cultural issues, mm. you move away from economic issues, mm. that would be bad in itself because it's that not a distraction. So it's a polarization it's a order problem. Yeah, not a first order problem. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because we could have a very lively debate on these cultural issues, but if it distracts us from real material questions. Yeah. Absolutely. So look, uh, I think, yeah, and, and the metric according to which, uh, and this is uh, something very similar goes on in the metric surrounding um, populism and, and extremism. Um, the, the assumption is uh, that, you know, the centre which constitutes what is actually being debated within mainstream politics is, you know, Fact that it's central is something virtuous, but you know what's central and what's extreme changes radically over time, and things move from the extreme to the centre. You know, it wasn't that long ago that votes for women were on the extreme, or being against slavery was on the extreme. And now that's been moved from the centre, and it's not then yeah, much more recent that you know neoliberal economics was on the extreme. Uh, now it's absolutely you know by definition the centre, so much so that it's, it's simply not debated. Uh, or challenged. Uh, so yes, I don't. Yeah. Second question is sort of similar. There is, uh, sometimes you see a, di um, a distinction between um, sort of um, uh, viewpoint polarization and effective polarization. Mm -hmm. So viewpoint polarization is good for democracy on, on the most accounts because you will have differing mm -hmm. viewpoints on policy issues or, or how a good society should look like, mm. and in an open public discourse, you can find out what's the best solution uh, in a democratic system. But then you have effective polarization that sort of touches on the issues with the echo chambers that you start mm. not only sort of opposing some views, but that you start um, having very strong emotions towards or sentiments towards yeah. the other groups. And there's one study I know of where they typically ask, again, it's in, in the US, so mm -hmm. where they typically ask uh, um, the members of the two parties, how do you feel about members of the other party? Warmth, yeah, and warmth is very often tested by asking, uh, so imagine you're a Democrat, imagine there's mm -hmm. a Republican, so how would you feel about him or her being your new neighbor? Mm -hmm being a working colleague or a family member. And there also is a tendency within the last 10 or 20 years, I don't know the exact numbers, that yeah. people tend to say, I don't want to have those people in my family, yeah. which could be a danger to democracy because you don't see the other as political opponent, but really as enemy, as someone who's sort of not um, um, on the same, not yeah. I mean, I look at level. Level. I, I mean, I, I viewpoint polarization. Yes, I agree with it. That, that, yeah. that's a good thing. Uh, but I also think uh, effect polarization can be a very good thing too. It depends what. I mean, you, you can't answer these things in a priori. Right? It depends what's going on in society. Um, you know, when when you know one of the major parties in in the late in the early thirties in Germany was was the Nazis, then you know being effect polarized was absolutely right and I, I think taking it to contemporary America look I certainly uh, wouldn't want to live next to a Trump voter I must say uh, and I'm extremely tolerant towards all sorts of people um, and but I think it's also striking you know that you use the American example where the majority of people don't vote at all and I think you know insofar as this polarization in America it's <laughs> What always strikes me is how close, even under Trump, establishment Democrats are on so many issues to Trump. And, you know, look, Trump had his own rhetoric, especially in 2016, most of which dropped, but in policy terms, yeah, what did he do? He introduced big tax cuts to his rich friends, just like every other Republican politician before him, and basically nothing else. He talked a lot about, you know, problems with NATO, but he did nothing. Foreign policy was essentially the same. Um, 
he complained about the big banks and Goldman Sachs, and then he made the head, former head of Goldman Sachs Treasury Secretary. And, uh, yeah. uh, so, you know, on all those issues, I think the, the problem wasn't polarization, it's lack of polarization, polarization of these issues. And, and I think a lot of Americans feel, and I, I, I don't, uh, I don't build this out as sort of a way to be rational, but the real divide is between uh, the establishment parties, the, the political duopoly, and those who vote and those who don't. And uh, uh, I think in European countries and in America, uh, we tend to think because almost everyone votes, that people who don't vote are uh, uh, apathetic, but I don't think that's in general true. Actually, in America, they are disillusioned with the system, and I can't say I'm totally blind on that, given where it's gone in the last 30 years. I have more questions, but you want to start? Well, maybe I'll jump in there. Yeah. I mean, you just uh, sort of um, basically in your reply came up with this contrast uh, uh, and polarization versus mm -hmm. lack of polarization. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether there aren't sort of more dimensions to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, lack of polarization uh, doesn't seem to me to get to the real issue mm -hmm. of depoliticization. That basically, once you know, um, for whatever yeah. reasons, cultural or otherwise, it's become um, a kind of um, impolite thing to talk about politics amongst friends or even family. It yes. is, uh, you know, all sorts of cultural issues that uh, are used as proxies for underlying political um, tensions that aren't re fully resolved. Yes. But, um, you know, I suspect that some of the depoliticization uh, is the result of, of um, cultural polarization, whether that is sort of top down because yes. they're vested interests that push these cultural issues mm -hmm. and of course not just in the us in germany too in other countries it's um, i mean think of culture wars that yeah. are created every once in a while to shore up partisan support and um, it seems like um it's more isn't it more lack of uh, political debate and um, as i think you rightly said uh, lack of calling out um ideological um sort of assumptions that aren't put up uh, for debate. Yeah, I, I agree totally. So look, uh, the, the, the one thing that has happened, uh, at least in the Anglosphere, and I suspect it is broader than that, is that the term politis to politicise something is a bad thing. <laughs> and um, I, I find that a bewildering attitude. I mean, I, I can't think of anything that is not better once it's been politicised. I think politicised, everything should be politicised. And, uh, you know, on the, on the left, had as its motto, at least the feminists in particular had as their motto in the 70s, that the personal is the political and, and, and we, should, we should stick to that. So, but yes, um, yes, I've, I've even, I've even seen, you know, grown up politicians saying we, should, we mustn't politicise the economy. Uh, uh, and in Australia, at least, you know, the, the economy is pretty much run out of hands. Uh, the ele our elected representatives, the Reserve Bank, has become completely independent, life of its own, and um, uh, that, um, <coughs> that expression, uh, there is no other way, it even has an acronym, TINA, uh, in English, uh, uh, has yes, become bypass. So if you, if you take this observation and apply it to the kind of philosophic critique of these neologisms, such yes. as uh, polarization, uh, fake news, mm. echo chambers. Um, is your sort of fundamental point then that this basically uh, distracts from the real issue, namely um, confronting what's, you know, the political system right or wrong and what's... Uh, yeah, you know? absolutely. And, and I think it's... It, it, um, I mean, I, I, as you probably gathered, I'm, I'm not a fan of neoliberal economics, but there's a sort of broader thing which I'm also brought up in this about managerialism. Um, I think you know that's in a sense the more fundamental uh, problem and, and we are sold uh, a metric that our interests are all you know common and of course they are in some states but they're, they're not at all you know, we all have an interest for example in um, combating climate change but some have uh, a much greater interest in it. For the most part, of course, um, rich people can get land high up away from the sea and, and, and be protected from it in all kinds of ways. So, even on that issue, we're not all in the same boat. Um, on 
that point, I mean, I would argue that nonetheless, um, having having sort of analytical categories um, yes. that allow us to call out novel phenomena where they exist, even if they might not. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. There are mm. all variations on the same theme. We kind of uh, know that there's a continuum. But I think I would philosophically, I'd be inclined to think it's still useful to have uh, a debate about what is an echo chamber, what constitutes polarization, yeah. what is a filter bubble, even if it then turns out that, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, it's really kind of overblown. Uh, or do you think that it's uh, so much of a zero sum game that any intellectual effort in, uh, invested into these topics? Um, is really a waste of time and have better be directed at the kind of ideological fundamental critique that you are. Well, I'm proposing. investing an awful lot of intellectual energy in the <laughs> I think that's a waste of time, but I, I do think um, uh, uh, that it's almost always, I mean, I think in my experience, from the closer I look at the, you know, the, the faddish new concepts that come out of social science and work their way into. Um, work their way into uh, academia and, and popular media. Uh, What's interesting always, you know, it's always unclear what they refer to, and what's always more interesting than you know, trying to identify what they refer to is trying to work out what's purpose the terms serve and why they've caught on. And, you know, uh, it seems to me that a great deal of this is uh, an epistemic panic, panic in response to the internet. Um, and, uh, you know, look, I, I'm old enough to have grown up on tabloid newspapers and a very, very different kind of information culture. Um, and I have some residual sentimentality for that. But on the other hand, um, you know, I think it's, it's just, it's just a new technology and it's just a new way of getting more information out of that. Uh, what I don't think, and I think this is another case, look, I've just been at a big conference on disinformation in, uh, in Stuttgart, and uh, I can say this explicitly then, but there's an attitude in almost every paper that I went to. Um, you know, there's this problem that people have false beliefs out there. And what are we going to do about this? And, you know, even thinking of the world in that way presupposes that, you know, we, don't suffer from this problem somehow. The we, we've got the true ones and we've just got, you know, the task is just to uh, get the truth across to people. And, you know, once you think that way, you're already thinking as an authoritarian, you're already assuming that you know better than the general public or, or the other people. Uh, and I think that's precisely what we need to avoid doing. Uh, and the question that sort of relates to this it's, it was originally a question about confirmation bias because you say it's no real bias. Yes. And, uh, and sometimes there's, for example, Keith Stanovich, I don't know whether you know him as a psychologist, Keith Stanovich, Stanovich is a colleague of Kahneman. Oh, yes, he, has written this, he has written this book, just came out recently, My Side Bias, about my side bias, mm -hmm. the bias that divides us. Mm -hmm. And he says there's actually. We should draw a distinction between confirmation bias and my side bias. So confirmation bias is, as, as was described on the board from McIntyre, is our tendency to seek out confirmatory evidence mm -hmm. and not uh, look for falsification instances. Mm -hmm. Falsification, and there's I think the pretty good evidence that we have this tendency in that in many respects. I mean, even scientists working on confirmation bias are prone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the, convince the confirmation bias. Um, and I mean, this famous just the, just the way yeah. we set up the way you put it, it's yeah. seeking, uh, it's, it's not a question that McIntyre has it, but it's uh, an attitude that we have toward evidence. He doesn't talk about it in terms of how we go about seeking evidence. Um, now, I mean, there's a kind of Popean story in what you said is, you know, and, and Popper's story, of course, is you know, what a scientist should do is not go out and seek proof that it's true, but go out and seek proof that it's false. <laughs> well, but look, I mean, uh, yeah, and, and we confirmatory evidence, but we also have to look what are possible instances of. But actually, you know, and, and an awful lot of scientists, I know, quite a lot of scientists working hard at this, say that because they've been influenced by Popper, even if they've never heard his name on this topic. But it, 
It's actually, I think, a, a, a distinction that makes no sense. I mean, what you do is you go and test it, uh, and you test to see whether it's true or false. And that's not, there's no such thing as testing to see whether it's false or testing to see whether it's true. It's just two ways of describing the same thing, testing it. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, what I guess they mean is being open to the possibility that it's false, not having made up your mind in advance. And yes, there's something virtuous about that. At least, you know, that's a prerequisite for genuine testing in the first place. You can go and test it if you've already made up your mind. Um, but yes, the, I mean, the, the, it's a sense that people talk about confirmation bias, talk about it as if we sort of reason from nowhere. As if, um, we start with this blank slate and approach all evidence in the same way, and we can't and shouldn't. Um, you know, I think I think that's just basically you know what Neurath's book was about. I think it's a fair metaphor for how we reason. We reason from what we currently believe, and we reason from the degrees of confidence we have in what we currently believe. And some things are non-negotiable, and some things are. And uh, there's no other way to do it, and there shouldn't be any other way to do it. And, uh, yes. So so-called confirmation bias is just doing what we should do, what we do do. You know? Okay, but, but then the, yes. the, I don't want to preserve a deep yeah. into this, but then there's a related phenomenon, sometimes yeah. also called confirmation bias, and right. someone who says it's better to call this my side bias yeah. because this is sort of what's sometimes also called motivated cognition. Yeah. So if you have a normative view on the world, yeah. you tend to uh, filter information according to this normative view. And there are these studies from KM, for example, mm -hmm. on all sorts of issues and, and the sort of surprising or interesting result is that people who are, are cognitive experts, as they call them, so they're very good in numerical reasoning, very good in finding arguments to that, training in statistics, maybe in logic and philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, tend to be worse when it comes to evaluating arguments and data and numbers. Uh, when the topics are concerning their political or moral agenda. So if you ask people about whether one famous experiment is about uh, uh, who uh, is carrying weapons in the US increasing or decreasing crime or the death rate, and then they give the numbers, they alter the numbers, the numbers are all fake, but the people have to evaluate sort of lines of numbers. And even those who are numerically good in, in neutral topics mm -hmm. are worse than the average when it comes to these sort of political issues. And this is sort of a, yeah, and I think this is sort of a sense where you can say this is a bias and it has to do with ideology or maybe even tribalism in a sense. And it's not sort of a, uh, yeah, not a moral panic or an epistemic panic to call this a real bias because there's no. a lot of evidence that even those who are cognitive experts who should know better yeah. are prone to do this. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I don't think, it, uh, I don't think that, I mean, that doesn't sound surprising to me. I mean, it seems to me, um, you know, another way of thinking about this is we're, we're all you know, stuck in our views. Yeah, but there's some other degree, which is yeah. point. Uh, um, Can I add a little yeah. thing just to make it more surprising? So, if you look at the normal bias, so called biases, mm -hmm. the Kahneman biases and the Fredrickson test, the higher the um, intelligence or cognitive abilities, yes. cognitive reflection, whatever you want to call it, the better people are in these tests, meaning the less uh, mistakes they make. Okay. But the same people, yes. once you change to the yeah, normative yeah. topics, yeah. are more prone to make mistakes because before, 15 years or so ago, mm -hmm. you thought if you get someone education in the system to thinking, use your numerical knowledge, your crystalline reason, mm -hmm. uh, statistics, blah, blah, then you are sort of, in a sense, protected against some of them common biases or mm -hmm. better protected than the average person. Yeah. But now it seems in sort of this 
So if you, it's your own. So you, are you suggesting that the, the, the the elites, they actually work? They actually yeah, the elites worse. are worse when it comes worse. to when, when it comes to uh, normative political normative questions, which sort of supports your view yeah. that uh, what the people said in Stuttgart, they think, oh, we know yeah. what how to think about this topic, and we have we know the facts. Yeah. Where in fact you can show empirically that very often it's not the case. It's just the opposite. Indeed. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, I guess, unclear about the details of the case. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not quite sure how um, how to respond to it, but there's no question, I think, that anyone who has studied or, or given classes in normative ethics will see that people engage in absolute shabby reasoning perfectly intelligent people will engage in what's transparently shabby reasoning um, about normative issues and embrace arguments which are obviously invalid or at least unsound because they already believe the conclusion uh, and they're looking around for something to support it rather than, as it were, we like to say in philosophy, following the argument wherever it goes. Right. Um, uh, Look, again, I think there's an issue here that, though, that, you know, I don't believe. I'm, I'm on several issues quite hostile to Plato, despite being owned so much to me, as all academic philosophers do. Uh, uh, one is his anti democratic stuff, uh, but the other, another is this dictum, which I think has been um, bad for philosophy, but we should, uh, like the wind, follow arguments wherever they go, because very often arguments just go. To bad places, and we shouldn't follow them there. Uh, and the, what reductio reasoning is all about, you <laughs> get somewhere, and actually, that's not where I want to go. Uh, let's start again. I mean, yeah, that I, know that, I know that's a that's phenomenon. That's an even though sometimes it's exaggerated. Yeah, no, it's an incomplete uh, response, I'm aware, because I'm not actually quite sure what to make of it, but I mean, I, I guess also that when it comes to normative issues, especially when they're ones in which there are genuine arguments pointing in different directions, which is often the case in the controversial ones, um, then smart people are going to be better at constructing arguments to convince themselves of what they already believe. That's exactly, that's exactly what Cain says in the end. Yeah, they use yeah. their own sort of yeah. acuity or their own sharp mind to, yes. as a weapon to defend their worldview instead of sort of yeah, uh, reflecting on, yeah. on their own views. No. And, and, that's, and that's interesting because it does it does suggest a, um, a reason for being skeptical of smart people. <laughs> it seems like the perfect uh, place to <coughs> open up the discussion. So first of all, thanks very much for the talk and the uh, conversation. And we have a few questions from the audience. And we'll also stop the screen recording in a minute mm -hmm. so that people can ask uh, in the Q&A.